Hi everyone, Dr. Matt here, and welcome to this lecture on peripheral vascular disease. In this lecture, we're gonna start off with definitions. Then we're gonna look at the pathophysiology of the two subtypes of peripheral vascular disease. We're gonna look at their signs and symptoms, so their clinical manifestations, how we diagnose, and then how do we treat and manage. So let's start with a broad definition of what peripheral vascular disease actually is. Well, it's a slow progressive circulation disorder, narrowing and blocking blood vessels outside the brain and heart. All right, so when we go to outside brain and heart, this refers to the peripheral. So when we see the P, so we have a P over here, a P over here, that's peripheral, outside the brain and heart. Then we go to blood vessels. Two subtypes here, we've got A for arteries, so we've got arteries, and we've got veins. So that's gonna be the two subtypes of peripheral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, and peripheral venous disease. Let's start across with peripheral arterial disease, or PAD. So what's leading to this disease? Well, it's a blocking or narrowing. What's causing this blocking and narrowing? Well, it could be a clot or it could be a spasm. They can happen, but by far the most common cause of PAD is atherosclerosis. So I did cover this in a previous lecture. Atherosclerosis, so if you haven't watched that video, please have a quick look, but atherosclerosis basically means that there is a plaque that's forming within muscular and elastic arteries. This plaque is forming in the intima lining, and this plaque is a fibrophatic plaque, okay? What leads to this? What, so what's the risk factors associated with atherosclerosis? Well, male sex is a big risk. Females post-menopause will catch up, but essentially males is a bigger risk. Increase in age, hypertension is a big one, smoking, dyslipidemia, Dyslipidemia basically means a high amount of the bad fats and a low amount of the good fats or cholesterol in your blood and also diabetes. Or also put obesity as well. So they're the risk factors that are increasing the likelihood of, of atherosclerosis occurring. Now in terms of PAD, the most common location peripherally will be in the lower limbs. So this is why I've got this diagram here. Here we've indicated the arteries, so this is gonna be for this side, and here we've got in blue the veins, so this is gonna be for this side. So this atherosclerosis for PAD is most commonly gonna affect the lower limb, okay? So that's what we're gonna basically concentrate for today. Now, what this leads to is atherosclerosis in the blood vessel will start to occlude. It will, this plaque will start to build up and build up and build up, and it's gonna start occluding the blood vessel, which is gonna to lead to a condition known as ischemia, which means a reduction in blood flow to an area. Now, we really have to get to about 70% reduction in blood flow because of the plaque to then see the signs and symptoms. So really, before the blood vessel is occluded by 70%, it's gonna be probably preclinical, so you're not gonna really see any signs and symptoms. But once we get to this amount, once we kind of get to this ischemia to that degree, we're gonna see the clinical manifestations. So what are they? The best way to remember it is what I call the five Ps. The five Ps are associated commonly with PAD. First P, so P1, pain. Pain is ischemic pain, usually brought on by exercise. So when the patient has this occluded blood vessel in the lower leg, remember it's an artery, by about 70%, once they start exercise, so once they start moving, let's say walking, they need more blood to the leg because the muscles are needing to generate energy, ATP, so they need lots of oxygen, they need more blood. But because we've got an occlusion, we can't get enough blood, so therefore the tissues run out of blood and that's gonna cause that pain. We see a similar pain, chest pain with angina, but in this case, the coronary vessels aren't delivering enough blood to the heart and that's causing the chest pain. Down here, we're seeing this pain in the legs. This is called claudication pain, which is pain that's brought on by activity and relieved by rest. Now, as this worsens, the pain can actually be there with rest. So the, the patient may actually have pain all the time. How would you relieve the pain at rest? Well, you'd actually hang the legs down. So you could hang them off a chair or off the side of the bed and that gravity allows greater blood flow to the area. Now, before I move on past pain, the blood vessel can dictate, where we have the occlusion can dictate where the pain is. So if there is an occlusion up, up higher, we we'll would actually see the pain in the buttock. If we see it in the common femoral artery, it's more likely to be in the thigh. If it's in the superficial femoral artery, it's more in the upper calf. It's in the pop if it's in the popliteal, so if the occlusion's in the popliteal, it's more likely the lower calf. And if the occlusion, ischemia, is in the perineal or the tibial, it's more likely 
to be in the foot or the ankle. So that's the pain. It's ischemic pain. It comes on usually claudication pain and it's more sharp like. The next pain, the next, the next P is pallor, which basically means pale. Because we're not bringing enough blood to the area, it's not going to be red with blood. It's not going to be perfused. Therefore, it's going to look pale. Another thing that it will be is cold. So we could do polar here, which means cold. So the limb will be pale and cold, and that's because not enough blood flow. Number three, paresthesia. Parasthesia. This basically means pins and needles. You may have experienced this when you've fallen asleep on your arm, it's gone dead, then you start to shake it out and it goes pins and needly. This is basically because the blood flow to the nerves is reduced. Now, in this case, because it's chronic, there could be a couple of reasons for this. It could be putting the nerves into a pro-inflammatory state, and those cytokines are caused in sporadic firing, which kind of makes it feel like pins and needles. Or it could be just a reduction in oxygen to the nerves, which is decreasing its capacity for ATP and regulating those action potentials. So that's P for paresthesia. Number four is pulseless. So if you try to take a pulse, it's either very faint or you can't get it at all. This could be the tibial pulse or the pedal pulse on the top of the foot. Very hard to get. And number five, we have putrid. So this is a bit of a placeholder, but putrid basically means necrosis and gangrene. Why is this happening? Well, again, if you're not bringing enough blood, the leg is not getting good quality oxygen and nutrients. We start to get skin breakdown. We don't have good healing because we don't have good blood flow. We start to get ulcers. The ulcers don't heal. They get infected. We get necrosis and then we lead into gangrene. So that's why I put putrid there, putrid flesh. So they're the five Ps, pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulseless, pulseless and putrid. How do we diagnose this? Well, you would do a physical exam. You would do a patient history. Part of the physical exam, you might auscultate you might listen with your stethoscope, and where you have over the occluded artery, you might hear a whooshing sound called a brouet, and this is an indication that there's occluded blood flow. We could also do a Doppler, so we could use an ultrasound Doppler, and you could see the blood vessels, and you may see the change in blood flow patterns. You could also do um, certain vascular imaging, particularly using dyes, so contrast, to look at the way that the flow is through the blood vessels. How would you treat it? Well, you would go back to the cause. So you could go up to the cause of atherosclerosis. So lifestyle modifications, you could, so obesity, help to lose weight, hypertension, so medication to help with hypertension. Exercise is very good because it promotes blood flow to the area, but it also promotes collateral vascularization of the blood vessels. Reducing smoking, we may use some medications, so medications for dyslipidemia like statins, and we wanna prevent clots forming, so we might use antiplatelet medications. There are also surgical options. So where the blood vessel is occluded, we may use balloons and stents to open them up. We may even bypass where the blockage is, or there might be some other surgical interventions to help with the blood vessel issue. Another thing with surgery is, particularly with the step five, is if there is gangrene, it may lead to amputation. All right, so now we move across to peripheral venous disease. So peripheral venous disease is affecting the veins, outside, again, the brain and heart. The crux of their issue is hypertension. So unlike over here, which was atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis is only in arteries, but over here, the peripheral venous disease is hypertension. So how do you get high blood pressure in veins? Well, normally, veins only have a blood pressure of five to 10 millimeters of mercury. Compare that to arteries, it's 120 millimeters of mercury. So the pressure over here is a lot higher than over here in the veins. So what leads to the hypertension? This is essentially blood not going back up. And again, PVD, like we saw with PAD, is most commonly seen in the lower limb or the leg. So what's leading to this hypertension? Well, the first one could be defects. Specifically, valve defects. So going back to a bit of AMP, remember the way that the veins get blood back to the heart is different to the way that arteries push the blood. Remember, arteries get the blood pushing through the generation of force from the heart, but also arteries have muscles in their walls, so that helps to push the pressure along. Veins have neither, so they can't generate the force on their own very well. That's why it's a low pressure. How do they do it? Well, they have muscles, skeletal muscles, that push when you walk, let's say, it pushes the blood back up. Now, as it squeezes, each squeeze will push the blood up the vessel. 
But as the muscle squeezes, it can also squeeze the muscle, the, the blood backwards, or as it relaxes, that blood could come backwards. So you don't want blood to go backwards. How do you prevent blood going backwards in veins? Well, you have these things called valves. So the valves in the veins, particularly the small superficial veins, these could get valve defects. Okay, so valve defects are fairly common in the superficial veins of the leg. This would lead to a condition known as varicose veins. So the risk factors associated with this would be female sex, particularly with many pregnancies, stand-in occupations, so spending a lot of time on your feet, because remember it's harder to push against gravity, and obesity. So basically what's happening is the valves become defective, so instead of stopping the blood going backwards, they become incontinent and leaky, so the blood will come and start to pull, which causes them to start to be filled with blood, and they become distended. And you'll see that on the outside of the legs where they're very close to the skin. Now normally what would happen as the blood pulls, the blood would divert into the central veins and the central veins would take up that extra slack and re re return the blood for you. But in some cases, the central veins or the deep veins also become insufficient. And this leads to a chronic vein insufficiency. And this is where we start to see the signs of peripheral venous disease. So what would the signs be? Well, let's compare it over here. Will you get a pulse? Yes, you'll get a pulse with the PVD side. But what we'll start to see is that the leg will start to increase in size because of edema. Because the blood is not returning, the pressure starts to increase. We saw that here, the pressure goes up, the hypertension, and that pushes the plasma and the fluid out into the tissue, and that causes edema. So we do see edema. It's red, it's warm, but the skin will start to discolour. So we actually see the skin in this condition, PVD, as brown, yellow. Okay. Now, the other cause of hypertension, so this is the other main effect, is actually a defect in the deep veins. And this would lead to a thrombus. So this condition is known as thrombophlebitis. Phlebitis meaning inflammation of the veins caused by a thrombus. So the most common location, so about 90% of them are in the, the deep veins of the leg. And so this is known as a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. What's leading to this? Well, there are three main causes, and this is known as Virchow's triad. And this would be number one, stasis. So this is, would be conditions where you're not using your muscle pump. So this would be long flights on aeroplanes or long extended bed rest. So that would be causing pooling of blood in the area, increasing the likelihood of clots forming. An increased coagulability. So this means you're more likely to clot. So what conditions increase your clotting potential? Could be pregnancies or post-surgeries or taking birth pills. And number three, Injury, so injury to the blood vessel wall. Again, this could be through inflammation or infection. So any one of these could increase the likelihood of a thrombus forming, which forms in the deep veins, which decreases the blood being taken back to the heart, and it starts to pull in the area, and we see, again, that chronic vein insufficiency. Now, if one of these break off, it could go up, back to the heart, and it's most likely to go into the lungs, and that's no, known as a pulmonary embolus. This is a medical emergency. So this is a, a risk associated with the DVTs. How are these um, diagnosed? Well, with the varicous veins, it's very simple to see them. So that would be basically with a physical examination. A DVT would be painful to palpate. It would also be very red and painful around where the thrombus is. So a physical examination would be important. Also, we could use a Doppler ultrasound like we saw over on this side. How do we treat? Well, with the varicose veins, we can actually take the veins out. So stripping the veins out can actually increase the collateral returning of blood. In terms of over here, we'd want to prevent thrombus beginning. So we would use TED stockings. So uh, these are compression stockings to help return the blood and stop the likelihood of clots forming. That would be through the stasis. And we could give some medications that would stop the coagulability of the clot or the thrombus forming. These would be drugs like warfarin and heparin. So there we have it, 
That is an overview of peripheral vascular disease. Hopefully now you know what it actually is through a definition. You know that there's two subtypes. You know what causes PAD. You know the common five Ps, how they're diagnosed, how they're managed. And then over here with the PVD, two main subtypes with the valve defects causing varicose veins and then the chronic vein insufficiencies and then the thrombophlebitis most commonly manifesting with DVTs. How, do we, how would we diagnose those? How would we manage this?